Hello, sweet sweetie. This is the second chapter in which I get started on this venture. I left New York in May. I had a pen knife, a ball of cord, an axe, and $40, which I had saved from selling magazine subscriptions. I also had some flint and steel, which I had bought at a Chinese store in the city. The man in the store had showed me how to use it. He had also given me a little purse to put it in and some tinder to catch the sparks. He told me that I, if I ran out of tinder, I should burn cloth and use the charred ashes. I thanked him and said, this is the kind of thing I'm not going to forget. On the train north to the Catskills, I unwrapped my flint and steel and practiced hitting them, hitting them together to make sparks. On the wrapping paper, I made these notes. A hard brisk strike is best. Best to hold the steel in the left hand and the flint in the right and hit the steel with the flint. The trouble is the sparks go every which way. And that was the trouble. I did not get a fire going that night, and as I mentioned, this was a scary experience. I hitched rides into the Catskill Mountains. At about four o'clock, a truck driver and I passed through a beautiful dark hemlock forest, and I said to him, This is as far as I'm going. He looked around, and he looked all around, and said, You live here? No, I said, but I'm running away from home, and this is just the kind of forest that I always dreamed I would run to. I think I'll camp here tonight. I hopped out of the cab. Hey, boy, the driver shouted. Are you serious? Sure, I said. Well, now, ain't that something? You know, when I was your age, I did the same thing. Only thing was, I was a farm boy and ran to the city, and you're a city boy running to the woods. I was scared of the city. Do you think you'll be scared of the woods? Heck no, I shouted loudly. As I marched into the cool, shadowy woods, I heard the driver call to me, I'll be back in the morning if you want to ride home. He laughed. Everybody laughed at me, even Dad. I told Dad I was going to run away to Great Granddad's gribbly land. He had roared with laughter and told me about the time he had run away from home. He got on a boat headed for Singapore, but when the game oh but when the whistle blew for departure he was down the gangplank and home in bed before anybody knew he was gone. Then he told me, Sure, go try it. Every boy should try it. I must have walked a mile into the woods until I found a stream. It was a clear athletic stream that rushed and ran and jumped and splashed. The ferns grew along its bank and its rocks were upholstered with moss. I sat down, smelled the piney air, and took out my penknife. I cut off a green twig and began to whittle. I've always been good at whittling. I carved a ship once that my teacher exhibited for parents' night at school. First I whittled an angle on one end of the twig, then I cut a smaller twig and sharpened it to a point. I whittled an angle on that twig and bound the two angles face to face with a strip of green bark. It was supposed to be a fish hook. According to a book on how to survive on the land that I read in the New York Public Library, this was the way to make your own hooks. I then dug for worms. I had hardly chopped the moss away with my axe before I hit frost. It had not occurred to me that there would be frost in the ground in May, but then I had not been on a mountain before. This did not worry me because I was depending on fish to keep me alive until I got to my great-grandfather's mountain where I was going to make traps and catch game. I looked into the stream to see what else I could eat, and as I did, my hand knocked a rotten log apart. I remembered about old logs and all the sleeping stages of insects that are in it. I chopped away until I found a cold white grub. I swiftly tied a string to my hook and put the grub on and walked up the stream looking for a good place to fish. 
All the manuals I had read were very emphatic about where the fish lived, and so I had memorized this. In streams, fish usually congregate in pools of deep, calm water. The heads of riffles, small rapids, the tail of a pool, eddies below rocks or logs, deep undercut banks in the shade of overhanging branches, all are very likely places to fish. This stream did not seem to have any clear, any calm water, and I must have walked a thousand miles before I found a pool by a deep undercut bank in the shade of, an o of overhanging bushes. Actually, it wasn't that far. It just seemed that way because I, as I went looking and finding nothing, I was sure I was going to starve to death. I squatted on the bank and dropped in my line. I did so want to catch a fish. One fish would set me upon my way because I had read how much you can learn from one fish. By examining the contents of its stomach, you can find what the other fish are eating, or you can use the internal organs as bait. The grub went down to the bottom of the stream, it swirled around and hung still, and suddenly the string came to life and rode back and forth and around in a circle. I pulled with a powerful jerk and the hook came apart, and whatever I had went circling back to its bed. Well, that almost made me cry. My bait was gone, my hook was broken, and I was getting cold, frightened, and mad. I whittled another hook, but this time I cheated and used string to wind it together instead of bark. I walked back to the log and luckily found another grub. I hurried to the pool, and I flipped a trout out of the water before I knew I had a bite. The fish flopped, and I threw my whole body over it. I could not bear to think of it flopping itself back into the stream. I cleaned it like I had seen the man at the fish market do, examined its stomach, and found it empty. This horrified me. What I didn't know was that an empty stomach means that the fish are hungry and will eat about anything. However, I thought at the time that I was a goner. Sadly, I put some of the internal organs on my hook, and before I could get my line to the bottom, I had another bite. I lost that one, but got the next one. And I stopped when I had five nice little trout, and looked around for a place to build a camp and make a fire. It wasn't hard to find a pretty spot along that stream. I selected a place beside a rock, mossy rock in a circle of hemlocks. I decided to make a bed before I cooked. I cut off some boughs for a mattress, and then I leaned some dead limbs against the boulder and covered them with hemlock limbs. This made a kind of tent. I crawled in, lay down, and felt alone and secret and very excited. But ah, the rest of this story. I was on the northeast side of the mountain. It grew, grew dark and cold early. Seeing the shadows slide down on me, I would frantically ran around gathering firewood. This was about the only thing I did right that, from that moment until dawn, because I remembered that the driest wood in a forest is the dead limbs that are still on the trees. And I gathered an enormous pile of them. That pile must still be there. That pile must still be there, for I never got a fire going. I got sparks, sparks, sparks. I even hit the tinder with the sparks. The tinder burned all right, but that was as far as I got. I blew on it, I breathed on it, I cupped it in my hands, but no sooner did I add twigs and the whole thing went black. Then it got too dark to see. I flicked steel and flint together even though I couldn't see the tinder. Finally, I gave up and crawled into my hemlock tent, hungry, cold, and miserable. I can talk about that night now, although it is still embarrassing to me because I was so stupid and scared and that I hate to admit it. I had made my hemlock bed right in the stream valley <clears throat> where the wind drained down from the cold mountaintop. It might have been all right if I had made it on the other side of the boulder, but I didn't. I was right on the main highway of the cold winds as they tore down upon the valley below. I didn't have enough hemlock boughs under me, and before I had my head down, my stomach was cold and damp. I 
took some boughs off the roof and stuffed them, un stuffed them under me, and then my shoulders were cold. I curled up in a ball and was almost asleep when a whippoorwill called. And if you ever heard, if you've ever been within 40 feet of a whippoorwill, you will understand why I couldn't even shut my eyes. They are deafening. Well, anyway, the whole night went like that. I don't think I slept 15 minutes, and I was so scared and tired that my throat was dry. I wanted a drink, but didn't dare go near the stream for fear of making a mis misstep and falling in and getting wet. So I sat tight. That was there his shelter. So I sat tight and shivered and shook, and now I am able to say I cried a little tiny bit. Fortunately, the sun had a, has a wonderfully glorious habit of rising every morning. When the sky lightened and when the birds awoke, I knew I would never again see anything so splendid as the round red sun coming up over the earth. I was immediately cheered and set out directly for the highway. Somehow I thought that if or somehow I thought that if I was a little nearer the road everything would be all right I climbed a hill and stopped there was a house a house warm and cozy with smoke coming out of the chimney and lights in the windows you know only a hundred feet from my torture camp and here's a here's a picture of him sitting under the trees being cold and damp and miserable Without considering my pride, I ran down the hill and banged on the door. A nice old man answered, and I told him everything in one long sen sentence, and then said, And so, can I cook my fish here because I haven't eaten in years? He chuckled, stroked his whiskery face, and took the fish. He had them cooking in a pan before I knew what his name was. When I asked him, he said Bill something, but I never heard his last name because I fell asleep in his rocking chair that was pulled up beside his big, hot, glorious wood stove in the kitchen. I ate the fish some hours later, also some bread, jelly, oatmeal, and cream. Then he said to me, Sam Gribbley, if you're going to run off and live in the woods, you better learn how to make a fire. Come with me. We spent the afternoon practicing. I penciled these notes on the back of a scrap of paper so I wouldn't forget. When the tinder glows, keep blowing, and add fine dry needles one by one, and keep blowing steadily, lightly, and evenly. Add one inch dry twigs to the needles, and then give her a good big handful of small dry stuff. And keep blowing. And that's it for chapter two. The next chapter will be called, I Find Gribbley's Farm. So I hope you enjoyed tonight's reading. Hope you're feeling good and uh, getting some rest. Love you.